Hello, Lab Insiders. Welcome to another riveting interview. I'm Max, and I'm joined by Samantha Kanza. She is a PhD from the University of Southampton. She's a coordinator at the AI for Science Discovery Network, a senior enterprise research fellow, and she's a coordinator at the Future Blood Testing Network. It's quite a title, quite uh, quite the resume. Uh, great to have you on, Samantha. Oh, thank you. We have a lot to talk about today in terms of uh, digitalization of scientific research, uh, about electronic implementation. These are these are buzzwords. Maybe you'd like to give us a little bit of a background uh, on, on on what it is you do and what you're involved with. So I do a lot of things, <laughs> must be told by me, <clears throat> by the title. Um, so yeah, so I I I'm a senior re uh, senior enterprise fellow at the University of Southampton, um, which I mean is basically just your level and says that I have a PhD. Um, I coordinate the two different research networks, so AI for Scientific Discovery, which looks at bringing um, cutting edge AI machine learning techniques together with cutting edge scientific discovery. And we've been running that network for three and a half years now. Um, it's built up quite a following there. And uh, we've just started with the Future Blood Testing Network, um, which is looking at trying to produce uh, rapid, afford uh, rapid, affordable and remote blood testing outside of the lab environment. And I also do my own research um, on semantic web technologies and on digitization of scientific research, which is obviously why we're here. Um, so I, fair background, I actually did my undergraduate at Southampton in computer science. So now I sit in the chemistry department masquerading as a chemist, but I'm not a chemist at all. I'm still a computer scientist. And when I did my master's project, I actually looked at, um, I identified different domains and different areas that used um, use semantic web and chemistry was one up on that list actually but then I found Jeremy Frey Professor Jeremy Frey who's my my boss and who was my chemistry PhD supervisor I found him completely by chance um, because I went to a so if you want to demonstrate as part uh, during your PhD and teach other students you have to go and do demonstrator training I ran into somebody I'd actually met at the Univers University of Bath years ago and I was sort of telling him oh you know I need to pick a discipline and I'm not sure but I've narrowed it down and he said oh you need to go and talk to Jeremy because he does really cool semantic web stuff. So I read a load of his papers. Will you supervise me? And then Jeremy introduced me to the notion of electronic lab notebooks. And that was just really cool. But I was also really baffled because he said to me, well, Sammy, people don't really, a lot of people don't digitize their stuff in chemistry. And I was like, I mean, that's a, that's a huge, uh, every, every time we talk about it, everyone seems to be, you know, coming to the same conclusion. Uh, you know, why? Why aren't we digitizing, right? Why aren't we using these ELNs? It just, it just completely threw me because, I mean, you know, I, I did a computer science undergraduate. Everything I did was on a computer. I mean, yes, I do actually use a paper notebook, but there is nothing in it that isn't on my Trello, on a list somewhere, on a central system with them. The principle should be that this should um, this should be a jumping off point to be able to upload the information because a lot of people seem to be writing in their own language, in their own style, um, and keeping it with them, and then data gets missing. But we've we've spoken about that in practically every episode of Lab Insider. So because I I really wanted to come in and basically investigate what on earth was going on and kind of look at it from both you know a technical but also a user perspective and see what we could do so what on earth is going on it's not that people aren't digitizing at all so i i, I looked at this subject very heavily for my phd i did um surveys did ethnographic research um and spent three and a bit years of my life doing that and then also recently um so i mentioned in my presentation um future Lab live we've been working on this project called psdi the physical sciences data science infrastructure they have lots of different case studies for this pilot project and I was put on the process recording in electronic lab notebooks which then gave me a chance to sort of reinvestigate the same sort of investigations I did three years ago or four years ago now I guess and see if anything had changed but yeah the main premise was people are digitizing some things but it I mean I am very much talking about an academic context like people use ELNs a lot more in industry because they don't they don't really have a choice. If your company mandates you will use this, you will use this. There is no such mandate in a university. That sounds like the stick approach. Um, is there a, the question is is there a carrot approach? Is there a successful carrot approach that's that's uh, convincing people to, to to use ELNs? There are some people that are really into the idea. Some people are really against it. Um, but the problem is that there's a lot of hardware and software and people barriers. They're the kind of the main issue. So. You know, I went round and looked at university labs and I actually 
did ethnography. I basically followed a bunch of scientists around the lab and watched what they did and how they interacted with their notes and their technology. And it's kind of crazy because, I mean, I, I did understand the point. Like I went into some of the labs and went, yeah, I probably wouldn't bring my laptop in here because there were chemicals. You worry about spilling things. Yeah, I mean, I did take my phone. So I'll say there's always scope for taking some devices into the lab. But again, I, I understand the point. Actually, yes, there's not a lot of space for a, a laptop here. Um, quite a lot of the labs had, some of the labs had computers. And I said, well, why wouldn't you use this computer? Oh, well, this computer's hooked up to this instrument and it needs to be, I, you know, I'd feel like it was appropriate to use it because it's this instrument or even this one's not actually online but it only works for this instrument or this one's actually got xp on it and we don't want to it has to be that for the instrument but actually we don't and we or i don't want to go on it because then we can't take it online because we're worried about viruses so there's all this one's only used for the health and safety things so i think we need to redevelop the lab and the lab practice all needs to be overhauled and i really think that we need to get people in we need to get people digitizing a lot earlier and we need to get the importance of digitization across earlier because, so, you know, I, I do appreciate, I, I don't know much about it, but I know there are sort of some studies about why it's good to sort of, you know, physically write things down and, and that's, that's important. And I'm not saying we should take that away, but I do think it's not, not most sensible when, you know, school, you're given your exercise books, you write in your exercise books, you write up your lab experiments. If you're doing, you know, at some point when you hit chemistry or physics for GCSE, you come to university to do an undergraduate degree in science. You are given a lab book, the processes that you write in your lab book. You know, you take those through to your master's, to your PhD. People get really entrenched in those, those habits. Absolutely. I mean, it's really hard to break habits, um, especially if the proposed you know, evolution of the habit uh, is not so intuitive, right? You're describing these keyboards hooked up to an, a Windows XP computer. Doesn't sound appealing to me at all. Like I wouldn't, I, I probably wouldn't do it and I'm not even working in that lab. Actually, uh, when when we spoke a little while before, you had some, uh, you had some pretty nifty ideas uh, about what could, uh, what could be done because there are some, uh, there are some things like, okay, I like to keep, you know, make notes, in my handwriting, I'd sometimes do a little symbol, uh, maybe even a picture, you know, a graphic representation. Uh, but I've really taken to uh, dictating. Whatever comes up in my mind, I like to say it out loud. Uh, I, 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 it definitely works for everyday shopping. It works for my reminders. Um, you you talked about this, that this is, this is possible in, in a lab setting, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think smart labs are definitely the future. I mean, we, we've set up a kind of demo smart lab um, in one of our physics laser labs. It's very much a, a kind of passive lab. We call it talk to lab because you can you, we have a bunch of Alexa set up connected to a bunch of sensors and you can speak to it and you can say, you know, Alexa, tell me what the temperature of, of this set you know, is coming off this sensor. Tell me what the laser power is. Smart homes are really common. It's so normal to walk into somebody's house. You know, Alexa, turn on all my lights, play this music, do this. I don't see any reason why that shouldn't become really commonplace in a lab setting. I mean, there are obviously barriers to overcome again. So security concerns and safety concerns and all of those need to be taken into account. But equally, those aren't concerns that don't exist in the smart home. And yet people still have them. So and obviously, yes, you need to be more careful in the lab setting. But also, I think it also vastly depends on what your lab does. Like we would need to do a lot more work before we felt comfortable controlling our laser with Alexa. That just spells disaster. But um, but I guess um, maybe there are less risky uh, solutions that, you know, a, a lab running on millions of dollars of, of funding probably wouldn't put their, you know, all the everything onto a voice activated uh, machine. But I don't know, is there something that we could, you know, say tomorrow, outsource to the to the voice, uh, voice activation? I don't know, open this door, uh, dispose of this. We, we need interconnected systems which is one of the big problems anyway because a lot of the software packages that people use don't play well together but if i think what you want your inventories hooked up to your lab so that you know things at smart scales for example i've weighed out extra much chemical it knows you've weighed out extra much chemical then it takes that it, you know writes it down the inventory so you know if you need to order more things that could also be done and again probably need a sign off but could at least send an automatic reminder saying by the way we think based on all the things that we've had through the scales you're running out of x you should order some more or you could tell it you know i am weighing out x much of this i think particularly being able to dictate into the lab notebook really should be one of the future situations because also i mean the scientists i spoke to one of the reasons they also didn't want to you know, take take a laptop into the lab was they said i find it intrusive enough to have to pick up a pen sometimes and write things down if i'm in the middle of an experiment some of them have special lab pens so that if they're if they're wearing gloves and they're touching things you know that they don't necessarily 
on their normal pens, they can at least, you know, just pick up the pens if they are dedicated to the labs, they won't come out of the lab and write things down. And even that is a little bit of a chore. So asking them to then take off their gloves, go over to a keyboard, type something out, like it's it's that's not gonna happen because that's making life harder for them. Whereas if you could say, you could just dictate it, like Alexa, I have observed this, or you know, set me a time for five minutes and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna tell you what I've observed. And if that went directly into either an electronic lab notebook or whatever notebook tools you were using that would be great. Also, I think hybrid technology, again, you need to think about some of the the hardware barriers. So things about chemicals and spillage and, and gloves, but you can get quite like industrial cases for, for iPads. I mean, I know that Jeremy and, and some of the team before my day, they did try out like almost cover things that you could use um, over tablets so that there were ways to do it safely. But also again, like technology needed to catch up. So that's the thing. Voice recognition isn't perfect, but it's a lot better than it used to be. And things like iPads, you know, they're, again, a lot better than they used to be. They're so swift and I see people taking notes and then I see people drawing on them. And I'm definitely seeing that used more and more. Whereas I think when they first came out, yes, they were lovely and you, you could play around on them. But I'm not sure that the kind of tactile interaction in the way you would write was anywhere near as good as it is now. And, and unfortunately, again, you had to get it to that point where people are saying this is good enough for me to use. So I also, and I think there's a lot to be said with I think hybrid technology. So either using an iPad or using one of those kind of almost e-writer things like the Remarkable or the, uh, the um, Quirk Logic tools, his name escapes. I think even Moleskin, which uh, which make uh, some those iconic little notebooks, they've even gotten into that. Um, so really, I mean, what we're, we're, we're talking about, the real barrier to entry is, is um, uh, we need holistic solutions. Yes. So I think... There's yeah, there's the hardware software, there's the yeah, getting the data that's in the lab or that you produce in the lab that goes into your books into the computer. But I think again, we also need to split this into two things. And this is what I've very much said with the kind of conclusions I came to both times around in doing these studies, is we need to improve digitization in terms of the amount of digitization. So the fact that not everything is getting from lab notebook to computer, that needs to be improved. But we also need to improve how things are managed digitally. And the thing is, they're not the same. They're not the same problem. Getting the information on in the first place and then handling it well. Yes, it's all part of the same like eventual solution. But I think those need to be addressed. They need to be acknowledged as different problems. So what kind of what kind of issues are we we talking about? When I mean, we've got security, you, you you did mention that obviously that people are uh, people are concerned with uh, potential interference, right? These are new novel solutions collecting voice data. What happens to that? Is that where where what other issues are there? But it's not just that. I mean, even if we take voice out of the equation and we we think about the digital stuff we currently have, so people's electronic lab notebook records or you know, notebook records in generic notebook and software or whatever. A lot of the software doesn't play well together. So people will have, you know, files in varying different formats that they can't then interlink together. You know, one of the big concerns about using an ELN, so I had this chat with someone at a conference the other day, actually, and, and I said, well, you know, one of the big concerns is if someone puts data into an ELN, will they be able to get it out again? Like, will it be stuck in there forever? And will it come out in some sort of questionable proprietary format that nobody else can use? And they said to me, well, why would they want to get it back out? And I was like, well, they they might want to. And people don't like putting things into things that they don't think they can get, get it back out of, even if, and I'm not sure that's the right argument to win it either. I mean, if I give you a safe and I say, put your possessions in here and you say, well, can I get it out again? I'm like, oh, I'm not sure about that. We'll have, we'll have, to, dis we'll have to discuss that. And I'm not sure we'll get it back in the format I came in probably wouldn't use my safe. And I'm not sure it's that that different. Like if people have got a choice between having notes somewhere and they can get to them and do whatever they want, or it's in a place where, you know, they might actually not be able to get it back out again. If they want to change, they need they're moving, they need to use a different system. So we need flat we need we need a formalized data standards. We need ELM providers and anyone who's doing kind of, you know, industry anyone who's doing the software side of things, you need to be able to get the data out in, you know, if it's domain based, in one of the standard domain based uh, data standards or something like you know json csv some, something that is usable and that people can use across all these different systems so that that's a really big thing another big problem is also people only digitize certain things i found that when i spoke to people they digitize the things that i guess either they had to or they thought were worthwhile so if their supervisor said you need to write me weekly reports weekly reports got written up, more stuff got digitized. If there was no requirement for that, 
things didn't necessarily get written up until they had to do a presentation. And again, obviously, you know, when you actually write, make PowerPoint slides, you condense everything down. So yes, something's made it onto your computer in a digital format, but it's not necessarily all the raw data and raw like stuff on your lab book that would have come in. If you're writing up a paper, chances are quite a lot more of that ends up in the paper. But normally only the final kind of experiment. So people are very unwilling to digitize things that don't work, which is a huge problem. So if they've spent time like, you know, tweaking a protocol or they've tried a bunch of different things to make something work and then you know attempt 12 works attempt 1 to 11 just gets left in the lab book which I think is really a shame and is it's a bad culture around that and we need to change that we need to change the culture that oh you know you only need to publish and digitize the success stories because it's really useful to know things don't work because otherwise people are keep eating it and keep doing it because they don't know it doesn't work because no one has told. Dr. Samantha Kanza, it's been a, an incredible pleasure, really, to get to get your insights on exactly this, on on getting data out into the, you know, out of the caves uh, and into the computers, experiences in the lab, uh, but also the kinds of technologies. It's been an incredible show. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. That was Dr. Samantha Kanza of the University of Southampton. Thanks for watching. See you next time.